I'm Liz, I'm one of the nurses that works at the Royal Free Hospital and I'm very happy here to come today to talk about the treatments that we offer or some of the treatments that we offer and how we manage some of the side effects. Normally we give these type of talks to other nurses or um, other healthcare professionals so it's slightly daunting to stand in front of a group of people who have had the treatments and probably know way more than I do about what it's like to receive them and how it actually feels. So anyone that has any comments I'd be grateful and other people probably would benefit from experience of actually receiving them. When talking about side effects, I just wanted to say first, there are some basic rules associated with side effects. Some of the side effects associated with treatments are quite serious. So it's very important to report your side effects, especially if they're new, when, when you first get them. We like this because it's also much easier for us to manage side effects when they're at a lower level. We really prefer you not to suffer at home um, until things are sort of serious enough to ring your doctor or your nurse at the hospital because then it takes longer for us to make you feel better and you have more time feeling dreadful, frankly. Um, we're very fortunate at the moment to have lots and lots of different treatments that we use to treat neuroendocrine tumours. So I've really just chosen to talk about the commoner treatments so that it benefits the most people possible in the room. So today I was going to talk about somatostatin analogues because I think that's the treatment that most people end up having. Radio targeted treatment, chemotherapy and I'm just going to touch briefly on the newer agents, the sinitinib and everolimus treatments. There'll be opportunity at the end to talk about any questions and if anyone has any comments, stick up their hand and we'll do it as we go. The reason I decided to talk about injections today, so the somatostatin anal analogue injections are this, the sandostatin LAR or the lamiotide autogel that you have. I think in terms of side effects, some of the side effects associated with these treatments are generally considered to be the lower level side effects if you compare them to things like chemotherapy. However, what we don't, what, the, the thing with these injections is you tend to be on them all the time for a very long space of time. So side effects that you might think are acceptable when you're on chemotherapy or something that is short term is not acceptable with these injections. We don't really want you to have even the lowest level side effects if you're going to be on something for the rest of your life. So I thought it was really important to talk about them today. I think with any treatments it's useful to have a basic understanding of how something works because it helps you understand where the side effects come from and it helps you get your head around why you're having the side effects. And I think generally, particularly with neuroendocrine tumours, some understanding about how the treatments that you're receiving work is a very empowering thing and it's really important that you are involved in that process. So here you can see an octreotide scan. If you are on a somatostatin analogue injection, you're likely, probably, to have had an octreotide scan. An octreotide scan shows up the receptors that are on the tumour. So if this is the tumour, the receptors on, your, on the surface, the octreotide goes and blocks those receptors. So if those receptors are causing you symptoms, so if you have the carcinoid symptoms, Generally, these injections will hopefully make you feel better rather than worse. The injections are basically given for symptom control, but they do have a gang of side effects for, them, for themselves, which we're going to go through. We're very fortunate to now have evidence that these injections also cause some tumour control 
in some groups of patients. So you also will have, we're now having increasing number of patients who have these injections and don't benefit from the sort of symptom control side effects but only get the side effects of the treatment. So these are the side effects associated with the injections. One thing we want to avoid is with any medication, the potential is to have an allergic reaction to it. And what we don't want to do is give you an injection that's going to last a month and then find that you're allergic to it and then you're allergic the whole month. Or you have symptoms which mean you don't tolerate it for the whole month. So what we do to try and avoid that is give a test dose. So anyone that will have been started on these injections will have been given a test dose for that reason. We don't want to start you on a treatment that lasts forever and it cause you problems and you not be able to tolerate it. So the test dosing avoids that. The other thing we do is normally start people on short-acting octreotide injections before you start on the longer ones. This proves and makes us know that you're definitely not going to react to it and we're not going to give you something and make you feel dreadful over the months to follow. I'd love to be able to say that we can avoid the pain at the injection site, but um, we don't have any magic miracles to make it not be painful. However, I, I have been talking to people recently that have been coming to the clinic, and they, there are some things that you can try and do in a, to make it feel slightly more comfortable. A lot of people find positioning helps. We generally get people to lie down and relax on the bed and get feeling very comfortable. However, somebody that came to me this week said, actually, no way, I just want to bend over, you give it to me, and I'm out there. <laughs> There's lots of people nodding in the audience. So we, sort of, we try and make it easier, but actually try different positions and try different ways of having your injection because it, I'd love to say it's a little kiss, but it's not. Um, we do try and be as gentle as we can. There's a degree of gastrointestinal symptoms with these injections. They're normally mild and normally well tolerated, these injections, however, some people do experience some abdominal pain when they've had their injection. And normally it's, it's treated very easily with simple painkillers like paracetamol, but I would encourage you to take them. As I said before, it's not acceptable to feel unwell with these injections because they, you're on them long term. So I know people don't generally like to take medication unless they have to, but I would encourage you to take a simple painkiller if you're finding that you get abdominal pain with this. The other thing that we do tend to see quite often is the steatorrhea, so the malabsorption of the fat, which Tara's talked about a lot. But I would just reiterate, if you are taking Creon, it's really important to take it properly and not take it regularly. A lot of people are advised to take it regularly three times a day or just in the morning or just at night. But you must take the Creon with food. So have a few mouthfuls, then take your Creon because, or whatever pancreatic enzyme you're using. It only stays in your system for 20 to 30 minutes. So it only works on that one meal. So it's very important to take it with each meal and also with snacks. Some people find that there is some nausea that goes with the short-acting injections particularly. Again, I would encourage you, even low-level nausea has an effect on your quality of life. So if you're experiencing nausea, it's really important to take something for it. Some people you don't use medication and use other ways to manage side effects like um, uh, diversional therapies and other ways so that it's not just about medication but it's important to address it and see if we can make it as good as possible. There is a, a raised incidence of gallstones with these injections and for the most part they're painless so 
if you do have painless gallstones, then you don't need to do anything about it. However, if they're painful, you sometimes need to have an operation to remove the gallbladder. But it's worth saying that most of the scanning that we do for your tumours anyway monitors the gallbladder and so we keep an eye on that. Often people have had the gallbladder removed with other surgery, so it's not a problem. We do see altered blood sugars with these injections. It's generally only with people who are diabetic already. And it's rare to become a diabetic when with these injections. If, if, you do, if blood sugars are a problem, then we manage them with normal diabetic medication, and we do that in correspondence with the GPs. There's an incidence, it's very rare, but there is an incidence of bradycardia, so a low pulse rate with these injections. It's very, very rare. We don't see it very often. Often people have a high pulse just in life, so sometimes it's not a problem at all. But I would say that there are the odd patient that we have to take advice from the cardiologist in managing it. So it's useful to move from the injections onto radionuclide therapy. And this is because we use the same receptors to give treatment than we use to target with the injections. But in this instance, we're using the octreotide as a carrier. So the octreotide is used as the carrier that goes to the receptors, but you, target, you label it with a radionuclide molecule. And by doing that, the radiation is taken directly to the tumour and treats just the tumour and as little of normal tissue as possible. Um, there was a study done by Dr. Timpanakis in our unit in 2009 that looked at treatment of symptoms with, this tr with, with radionuclide therapy. It's worth saying that radionuclide therapy and the injections both generally make people feel better rather than worse. And the review of the, the patients that we had at the Royal Free showed uh, above 70% of those patients looked at had a reduction in their symptoms following this treatment. These are just the, the uh, isotopes that we use at the Royal Free. Yttrium-90, lutetium-177. It's useful to break the side effects of, of PRT, so radio-targeted therapy, into the during treatment side effects and post-treatment side effects. I think one thing we underestimate the effect of is the isolation associated with the radio-targeted therapy. When you're having this treatment, you must be in a lead-lined room. So you're isolated from people being able to visit you or even nurses coming into the room. At the, with the molecules, with the peptides that we use, it's only for one night in hospital, so it's short term, but it's really important that we ask people about this, because if anybody has any claustrophobia at all or is anxious about it, we need to address it. And we can give medication that helps with anxiety, and often people like to take a sleeping tablet for that night when they're in hospital so that they just go to sleep, basically, and not worry about it. It's also worth saying that the room, when we say you're going to be in a lead lined room, it almost feels like it's going to be this box. But it has a window and it has a door and the door can be open, but it just means that you need to be isolated for radiation protection reasons. Most of the side effects associated with during the therapy are linked with the amino acid infusion that we give during the treatment. This is given to protect the kidneys so it's really, really important, but we do try and manage the side effects. This drip can cause some nausea and vomiting, and it can cause some abdominal pain. We manage the nausea and vomiting by giving heavy-duty anti-sickness medication before, during, and after the treatment. Also, the abdominal pain is normally mild, 
but it can be treated with some mild side uh, painkillers like paracetamol or something very simple. Post-therapy side effects are the things we worry about the most are the bone marrow toxicities and the renal toxicities. So bone marrow toxicities is your full blood count, so when you go to have your blood test done. So haemoglobin, white cells and platelets. And the renal is your kidney function. These are the side effects that we've seen most and probably are the most serious side effects of the treatment. This is why we make you have all those blood tests afterwards. So we monitor this really, really closely and everyone after treatment has weekly blood tests for several weeks afterwards. What we tend to see is that they all raise and there are problems with them initially and then it all tails off. And the reason we do repeated blood tests is we want to see a trend of improvement and that's why we make you, I'm sorry, go for all those blood tests. So with some people, if they had pain prior to treatment, the pain can get worse after the treatment. And this is because the treatment itself causes inflammation. So this is particularly with bone disease and liver disease. And we do see what we call a tumour flare and which causes increased pain afterwards. It's rare, it's, it's temporary is what I was going to say, and it does get better. But if you do have pain prior to the treatment, it's important to make sure that you have enough painkillers when you go home, and we sometimes give people stronger ones to take home. And there we then advise of what to use. I wanted to just talk about fatigue. I think having the disease in general causes fatigue. I think every treatment we can possibly give causes fatigue and fatigue is one of those symptoms that can't be measured, it's really hard to describe but has a really really huge effect on your quality of life. Uh, yeah. I wanted to just put here the Macmillan website for everybody. This is an excellent website, second only to the Net Patient Foundation one obviously. <laughs> Um, there's a whole section. A lot of people shy away from Macmillan because the, of the, it's synonymous with end-of-life care. However, Macmillan has very much changed over the recent years and they have a whole section on their website now about managing and living with cancer and there's a whole section on fatigue management and I would advise everyone to go and look at it because it really is very good and it gives really useful tips. These are just four of them. Everyone should do, do just a touch of exercise to help with fatigue. I don't mean going out and doing an aerobics class, but it means you get out of the house, get dressed, and at least you're out of the house. It's good for mood, and it's good for maintaining a sense of normality. I think a lot of the treatments that we give, that's the one thing that it affects the most. It makes normal life very different. And I think the aim for everybody, whatever treatment that you're having, needs to be thinking about what your normal life was before all this happened and trying to maintain it. And I think fatigue is the one thing that affects that the most because other symptoms can be treated with a tablet generally. Activity spacing is really good because it means you get everything you want to in the day and what that means is don't try and do everything at the same time. Give yourself a chance to do things during the day. Make sure you talk about it, explain to people how you're feeling. It's hard to explain and you say, oh actually I'm a bit tired. It doesn't mean very much but if you can explain to people the effect that this is having on your life, it, it might help them understand a little bit. I put relaxation and sleep because it's really strange. You can be fatigued and cannot move during the day and then still not be able to sleep at night. So sleep management is actually really, really good and relaxation tapes, story tapes, also really help to help maintain some sleep and get that relaxation that you need. 
chemotherapy, I wanted to just give a general review of chemotherapy and how chemotherapy works in general. Chemotherapy is generally given for pancreatic or high-grade neuroendocrine tumours. And generally, chemotherapy attacks rapidly dividing cells. So a cancer cell is a cell that has mutated and basically gone crazy and is dividing and dividing and dividing. The reason you get side effects with chemotherapy is because you have other cells in your body that rapidly divide and chemotherapy can't determine between the cancer cells and your good cells that rapidly divide. So the cells in your body that rapidly divide is what governs how you get your side effects. So they are your GI tract cells, which is why you get a sore mouth and why you get indigestion type symptoms why you have diarrhea and why you get some upset stomach in general. Your skin cells are affected and that's why you have dry skin when you're having chemotherapy and it itchy skin often when you're having chemotherapy. Your blood cells, so we all bang on about having your blood checked when you're having chemo. It's because your red cells, white cells and platelets are the cells that are affected when you have chemotherapy it's really important that you follow the rules about having your blood taken and when you have your blood taken while you're having chemotherapy and your team who's giving you the chemo can advise you at the times you need to do that. Your fertility cells are one of your rapidly dividing cells and your hair follicles. So your hair follicles, we're lucky that a lot of our, most of our regimes don't actually cause that much hair loss but it does affect your hair follicles, so some people notice some thinning, even if you're not on drugs that you completely lose your hair. And I wanted to just put some of the regimes up, because you end up getting a letter saying cap cyst, cap strep, F cyst, doc syrup, you know, and it's like some foreign language. All this tells you is the drugs that are being used. There's a common misconception that chemotherapy is one generic thing, chemo for everything and different drugs work on different diseases. So again, the Macmillan website has every drug listed and you can look into them. Also, the Net Patient Foundation has all of our regimes specifically on the high-grade booklet. Um, I wanted to just give a very basic guide to nausea and vomiting because I think nausea and vomiting is one of the things that causes people the most anxiety and it's the thing that people worry about the most, particularly with chemo. There are different types of nausea and vomiting. Acute nausea and vomiting tends to be immediately after treatment, so you've had your chemo one week and you feel a bit sick the next. It's normally treated by the anti-sickness regime that's given with your chemotherapy. If it's not, then you need to keep a diary of the days that are bad, and when you next go to, the, to, to see your oncologist, you then report back on what that cycle was like, and they will make changes related to that. Don't also, if it's terrible, you don't have to wait to see your oncologist, speak to your nurse specialist if you have one, or your GP. Delayed is, some chemotherapies have acute nausea and delayed nausea. And if that is the case, normally the regime involves some, some sickness pills that you then take home and use as and when. Please use them. If sickness comes back, it doesn't mean something dreadful. It's just that delayed nausea is associated with some chemotherapy drugs. Anticipatory nausea is definitely a real thing. Some people think they're going crazy because they feel sick when they just walk up to the chemo suite or go to the clinic. But anticipatory nausea is real. It's not you going crazy. There are things we can do about it, and there are anti-anxiety medication that we can give to treat it. I think the basic message is to say that nausea and vomiting is a drug that we can, is a symptom that we can do things about, and there are millions of different sickness medication, and there are millions of different medication for all different symptoms. 
Breakthrough is when you're on a you're on a sickness regime, and the sickness bre breaks through, comes through in between the day. What you need then is something extra, so you have an extra drug that you take just at that time. There are lots of different types. I didn't think it was useful for me to actually talk about names of drugs here because different hospitals will have different regimes and have slightly different drugs that they use. So I thought it would just confuse and make life harder for you actually. Refractory nausea and vomiting is where what you've tried hasn't worked. And sometimes we need to use injectable anti-sickness drugs, sometimes we need to use IV, and sometimes we need to use continuous infusion using a little pump. All of these things are normally temporary, and there are periods of time when sometimes your sickness is just worse, but it normally passes, and it's normally associated with something else that's going on. So if you're otherwise unwell, you don't always absorb drugs as well as you normally would, for example, and you need just a little change in your regime. If that happens, it's not a disaster, and most people get back to what their normal is. But you have to do what you have to do at the time to make yourself feel as good as possible. What, what I would like to say is, Often when you're feeling at your worst, somebody comes and sits with you and asks you intricate questions about how you're feeling, what you're doing and everything. The reason we do that is not to be mean, but because it's really important to get a really good history of your sickness. Now I'm talking about sickness now, but that could be any symptom, be it constipation or pain or whatever. So it's really useful to keep a diary of the medication that you've used and how it worked and did it work at all. Because otherwise, if you're feeling dreadful, you turn up to A&E or wherever and they stick you on a drug you've been on before and it didn't work then, so it doesn't work now. So it's, it's useful to keep your diary of your own medication of what's worked and what hasn't. So that when someone asks you loads of questions, you can go, oh no, not cyclozine. I've had that before and it was rubbish. Um, I thought it might be useful to talk about why we choose some of the drugs that we do and it's because different types of sickness drugs work on different parts of the body. So there are certain drugs that work on the vomiting centre in different parts of the brain and there are different parts that work on receptors in different parts of the abdomen. So if it looks like we're just randomly collecting these drugs together for you to try, sometimes we are, but there is some method to it. So often it's useful to use a drug that works centrally and something that works on the, on the gut for the best thing. It might be worth asking why you're on something because it's not, it's not totally complicated, but it's useful to know why we use some of the drugs that we do. And it's worth remembering what Tara said about helping with the sickness with diet, because what we don't want is for you to feel sick and not eat at all. Because one of the things that makes you feel as well as possible is to be as nourished as possible and to be as hydrated as possible. So if you're not maintaining your oral intake, we need to do something about your medication or do something. So you need to keep telling us how you're feeling. So I wanted to just very quickly talk about sinitinib and everolimus. These are the sort of new kids on the block, and they're the drugs that we use. We've been using them for about a year and a half now. So I wanted to just take you through the intricacies of this slide. Um, I'm only joking. This just <laughs> this is basically the growth patterns of a tumour. I'm not going to go through it. That was a little joke. Um, both of those drugs work on different parts of the growth pathways of the tumour. So they work slightly differently to chemotherapy, but they do give side effects, I'm afraid. So sinitinib works on the tyrosine kinase pathway, and everolimus works on the mTOR pathway, and they're basically just different pathways of the growth plan of the tumour.
These drugs, unlike chemotherapy, are drugs that we want to give continuously. So even more so with than with chemotherapy, we want you to report your symptoms as early as possible because what we don't want is to have to stop the drug. If we do have to stop the drug, it's not a disaster and quite often we have to reduce the dose just because it's got to be tolerable and it's got to not ruin your quality of life. <laughs> Karen's smiling at me. Um, so they have a gang of side effects, both of them, that are quite similar. They generally are very abdominal in that you get some abdominal pain and some diarrhea. Sunitinib particularly causes hypertension, which we keep a very close eye on, and some people need to have medication to help grow up, control the blood pressure. That's not a disaster. It's much better to be on medication to control blood pressure than tick along with a really high blood pressure. Also, we can't give the drug at full dose or at half dose if, you're, if your blood pressure is not, not controlled. Um, in the same way as chemotherapy, it, can, it affects bone marrow suppression, so we watch that very closely. It can cause heartburn, which we manage well. We do have the sinitinib man here today, if anyone has any particular sinitinib questions. Everolimus particularly has a, uh, a serious side effect called pneumonitis, which is why we always ask about chest symptoms when someone's on everolimus. It's rare, but it can happen. I put this slide on because actually neuroendocrine tumours, symptom control, or anything to do with neuroendocrine tumours is very much a team approach. And this is just an example of all the people that are involved at the Royal Free. And we, we need everyone. And it's a very much a multidisciplinary approach. So that's, that's all. If anyone has any questions or comments. Um, I'm just, I'm on um, Sumatulin, uh, and I just wondered, <coughs> what's the sort of time scale for developing uh, gallstones? Do we know? Or is that an impossible question? Yeah. Sorry. I'm afraid, I'm afraid we don't. They, it, it, it completely varies from person to person, but it's generally monitored with scans. Are you having imaging done? Yes. Scans, yeah. So it, will, it would be picked up on scans. Thank you. Dennis Rawling. Oh, hello. <laughs> uh, a dirty question. Yes. I'll put it to you. Which of those treatments would you prefer to take? Oh. <laughs> after, uh, all, after all, you're asking me to make yeah, that same Yeah, exactly, decision. exactly, I know. It, it, that's a really difficult question. I know. <laughs> They're all, they all have their pros and cons. It's, I can't answer that, Dennis. I do, I, I, it's a very personal decision. I, they all have their pros and cons. Some people say chemotherapy is easier because it comes in, in cycles, and so you have time to recover. And some people say everolimus is better, sunitinib is better because the symptoms are sometimes a lower level, but you have them all the time. So it, 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 completely var it completely varies from person to person. And some people tolerate the tablet medication, so the sinitinib is better than others. So some people swan through it and don't have any side effects at all. And some people really struggle. So it completely, it's really hard to comment from your particular point of view. I've learned one thing, my friend David here, tolerates the radiotherapy very well. Radiotherapy, yeah. The itrium, the tissue. Oh, the lutetium, yeah. But that's the whole point. Like some people with every treatment, with the injections, we have some people that we start on injections, they can't tolerate them and have to stop. And then we have some patients that have every treatment, one after another after another, and tolerate it all. So it's very hard to comment because everyone tolerates the treatments differently. Thank you.
I'm sorry, that's a sort of non-answer, isn't it? it <laughs> Um, just about these treatments, um, like the radiotherapy, can it only be given once, or in the future can it be given again? Yeah, or it can be how? given again. Is we that do the chemotherapy have... and that? Is it reviewed every so often? Yeah, yeah. Treatments can be given again. It depends how you responded to them. So if you responded really well to chemotherapy, for example, and you have a long break not needing chemotherapy, then you're likely to, you, you may well respond again but it's not always the case. And it's the same for radio-targeted treatment. We do have some patients that have had more than one cycle, but you tend to have three, we give three or four treatments in one treatment regime. And do you sort of have to wait a certain period of time before you review it again, or does it yeah. depend on each patient, yeah. like most things seem to yeah. with this disease? So generally when you finish the treatment, you then go on to a monitoring regime. So depending on what scans or what, however you're being monitored, show is determines what happens next so it's, there's not a fixed path that everyone goes down it's very individual and some people have treatments and have the same ones again and some people will need to do different you know different ones straight away but it it completely varies person to person